Welcome to Alpha Coding Podcast, an all-access pass to medical coding and billing pro tips that help you start your week off smarter. And now, here is your host, Tony L. Holmes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Alpha Coding Podcast series. I am your host, Tony L. Holmes. Welcome to episode 37 of the podcast. Today is September 14th, and I'm super excited for today's episode because I'm going to be interviewing a professor, a psychologist. He's really a guru on all things virtual learning, virtual work. So I'm excited. He's going to give us some great tips about navigating the remote reality. So before we dive into our topic, it's time for your Monday dose of positivity, the Mindset Monday tip. And it's brought to you by Clara. Clara is a holistic, secure communication platform that specializes in telehealth and telemedicine. Take your practice virtual in a matter of minutes. Mention my code Alpha Coding for special pricing. Visit Clara.com for more information. So our Mindset Monday tip is all about embracing your journey. It's important that you fall in love with the process because it's not a temporary situation. Your journey is your own journey. So the quote I want to share with you says, it's your road and yours alone. Others may walk it with you, but no one can walk it for you. And I truly believe that this quote has so much power because so often when things go bad or when things don't go our way, we have this expectation that it's a setback. Why me? Why did this happen to me? Well, who else should it happen to? So I think that mindset shift of just embracing your journey, knowing that challenges and struggles and setbacks are going to be part of the process really is a game changer. Have an open mind, step into your power and claim your destiny. That's what it's all about. It's your journey. So our guest for today is Dr. Thomas Kramer. He is a PhD psychologist and he also has a master's in public health. He is a professor of psychology at Daytona State College. Dr. Kramer is an accomplished academic and has published many scholarly articles on topics such as addiction, trauma, and even the use of electricity electronic health records in behavioral health, to name a few. I invited him on the show today to discuss his best pro tips for navigating the new normal we know as the remote reality. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Kramer. My pleasure, Tony. Dr. Kramer, you've had some really interesting experiences with living through 9-11 in New York and Hurricane Katrina. Can you tell us more about those experiences and how they relate to the current pandemic and specifically your perspective as as a therapist and a public health professional. Sure. Uh, 9-11 and Katrina were specific events that happened. I think everyone that lived in New York, everybody who lived in this country was so, so shocked by it. But what it was was a snapshot in time. And it gradually, and it took a while, went away. And we lived through it. With Hurricane Katrina, this was our nation's greatest natural disaster. I did three tours with the Katrina Project. And the thing was to, to get therapists to go into the New Orleans area into the Mississippi Gulf Coast and deal with the people who had survived Katrina. A lot of them were suffering from PTSD and the most common remedy for PTSD is a home remedy and it's basically uh, stay at home and get stinking drunk every night so that you don't have to think the thoughts of what had happened to you. So the federal government recruited a lot of us who had expertise in addictions and in trauma and sent us down there to try to get people to let out their feelings and relive their experience is through talk therapy more than anything else. It was basically a, a, a PTSD first aid type of band-aid to help put on it. Now, what we're seeing today with the COVID-19 pandemic is very different because it's not a singular event. It's been going on with us for quite a few months now. And the specter is that it's going to continue. Burnouts are where we start to bring things home with us. In a sense, we talk about work-life balance. Well, the pandemic has thrown us off of that. And so the type of thing that we see with care workers, people who do child protective services, people who do trauma in emergency rooms, they suffer a lot of burnout. And I think as a society, we're we're suffering a burnout from this pandemic. So you teach courses in organizational psychology. Can you tell us a little bit more about kind of this rapid shift in the workforce going from, you know, traditional going into the office to now working remotely and some of the social impacts? Yeah, well, we've been working uh, remotely now for about 10 years, but it hasn't been anywhere near the degree that we were thrown into probably around
around March or April. So a little of it had been in the works, but now all of a sudden is we're just seeing a lot of people working remotely and trying to get used to doing that. Right now, what we're seeing organizations scramble for is learning how to build virtual teams and how to lead virtual teams. If you're talking about a big company, you know, maybe it's one of the big banks, Citicorp or, or, or someone like that, they're going to have uh, IT people around the globe. They're going to have some in India, they're going to have some in the Philippine Islands, other places like that. So they've had that happening for them, remote teams. And for other organizations, this is all pretty new. So I have a friend who teaches for Dale Carnegie, and right now they are being flooded with requests for their trainers to go out to companies and help them organize how do you lead virtual teams. And that's that's something that we're going to be learning for the next year or two. And I don't think it's going to go away. We know that there are a lot of cost efficiencies by not having people come into the office. And if we can master how to best handle these things, then it's going to make us a more efficient country and a more efficient economy in the long run, which is a good thing for us. So your background is specifically teaching at the university level. Tell us more about what your experience has been with that. And is education, is teaching online, is that the future? Yeah, it is. But it's not for everybody. One of the things, well, let me give you a little bit of my background is for the last 14 years, I've been teaching for one of the big internet schools. I teach for two of the big internet schools in their doctoral work, but that kept me home staring at a computer screen. So I went to the local college here in Daytona Beach and asked them if I come in and just do some classes here and there. So I'm doing some face-to-face -face work and I really get a, a bang out of that. These are undergraduates. And then the other work that I do online, like the industrial organizational psychology courses I teach are all at the doctoral level. The kids who are going to college out of high school, they want a college experience. And you're not going to get that online. A lot of them are talking about feeling cheated, that they think they need to pay less tuition because they're going online and they're not going into a classroom anymore. The cost doesn't go down because you went online. So that's kind of a misnomer about, well, you know, we should pay less. The cost is the cost. You still have to pay the faculty and the administrators and everything else. But what we're seeing is a uh, finally, and I would say since the beginning of the millennium, uh, we're finally seeing the promise of lifetime education come to come to fruition. We started talking about this in the 1960s. President Kennedy started a program to send middle-aged people back to college and get retrained. And those programs worked for small percentages of people. In the 1970s, we saw colleges open up weekend college and night nighttime college. And you know what? I, I did some nighttime college. Uh, I took some courses in public health before I entered a real public health program. And it's tough. You work all day, you go home, you have supper, you get in your car, you drive to a college and you sit in a class for a couple of hours. That's tough to do. And so a lot of people never took advantage of that. When we opened up the internet, there were a number of, of universities that said they were going to give it a shot. And they were all for profits. The, the public universities didn't want anything to do with the internet when it started. And the faculty just didn't want to do anything with it. But the privates did, and they saw an opening. And what we now have is a lot of people who said, you know, I don't want to drive to a college and sit there for two hours, but I can go into the other room, get away from my kids, maybe my husband or my wife, or whoever it is, and spend an hour online and do some schoolwork. And they do. And so what we've seen is this online education has really opened up for uh, adult learners, much more so than what we think of as traditional college students. So I would say my demographics are people in their late 30s, mid 40s. Uh, they're often, you know, because I'm teaching in psychology programs, they're often in the public sector. So they work for the Department of Corrections, or they work for the Department of Education, or they work for the Department of Children and Families. And what they are is at a certain level, and they would like to get moved up in the organization. And one of the ways that we do that, we reward people who go back to school and study and bring it to the company uh, more knowledge than when we hire them. Definitely creates a lot more access. And you brought me back to my days going to nighttime school as well. I remember, I think it was four days a week from 6 to 9 p.m. at night after you've worked all day. It's it's tough, but those were the days that really make you because it's a sacrifice. It's it's something that you actually have to put effort into. It really is. And I, and I congratulate you on having done that because there are so many people that said they wanted to do those things and they didn't. And they just, and for many Many of them, they just couldn't. It was a, too much of a burden, but the internet has changed that game dramatic. So we're seeing lots of people going back to school and we're seeing them get advanced degrees, which is great. Absolutely. So a lot of parents are <laughs> struggling
struggling to say the least with helping their kids adapt and navigate remote learning virtual school. Can you talk about this a little bit and give our listeners some pro tips? Yeah, I can a little bit, but I, I want to put a caveat out there is that I don't teach primary school or even high school. I'm, I'm a college professor, so I don't know that other than I, I do know what it's like to be teaching on the internet. And I got a, a picture texted to me from my niece, Kristen, and her son, Bennett. It's a picture of him in the living room in front of a computer, and she says, it's the first day of third grade. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's kind of unique. We, we're not used to having someone start third grade in the living room. We're used to getting them to go to school in the excitement of meeting their friends from last year and all of those types of things. So uh, my heart goes out to the parents uh, who have their children doing remote learning. But at this point in time, depending on where you're living in this country, we don't have a choice. We're asking to have social distancing. We're asking to have you know, sanitation. Well, third graders, what do they do? They chase each other around. And you know they're going to be taking their masks off. And there's always going to be somebody teasing somebody. So it, it's, it's very tough. One of the tips I give to the adults, and I think it might work for children as well, is to tell your family, and it might be your husband and your children, it might be your wife or just the spouse, that says, when I'm wearing this cap, okay, whether it's your favorite sports team or maybe it's the school you're going to get their school cap, when I'm wearing the cap, it means I'm in school. And so unless the house is burning down, try not to disturb me. Even if I'm in the kitchen making a sandwich, if I've got the cap on, it means I'm trying to think through one of the discussions that we're having online. And so I'm still in school, even though I may be walking around the house. And you can always tell because I have my cap on. And this is an easy way to get your family to help. A lot of times families say, well, we, we support you, but they're not sure. No one in the family is sure what family support really means other than the encouragement. But when we can have some specific tips where we can say, you know, please try not to disturb me when you see me doing this, you know, that's a great way to have the family be an active part of trying to help you get through it. So I encourage that thing a lot. That's a great tip. I, I like that cap tip. I'm going to, I'm going to have to try that when I'm working from home. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> So what are your top three pro tips for adults that are adapting and navigating remote learning? I, th I think that it's that this is a long haul and it's not a, a short little thing. I see people who come into colleges and their, their big thing is to try to get through as fast as they possibly can. But concentrate on the learning part of it and not be the end goal of getting some degree or getting some promotion. If you're truly learning the topics that you study, then that's going to be beneficial to both you and for the company that you're Working. And that's really what it's about. You know, what I say to a college freshman at Daytona State first day, I said, no one's going to ask you what you ever learned in Dr. Kramer's class. Uh, but what they are going to want to know is, do you have communication skills? Do you have uh, the ability to be a leader? Do you know how to get things done? And these are the kinds of things that we try to get to our, our kids, whether it's junior high or high school or college, is what are those things that are going to make you a leader? And we don't want to stay as a, a line with us for a while. We want to be promoted to supervisors or managers or assistant vice presidents or CEOs. And the way we do that is to learn how to communicate and learn how to lead. Absolutely. It's all about that commitment to lifetime learning. So you're currently teaching face-to-face -face classes at Daytona State College. Can you tell us more about how things have changed and what is the college doing to keep everybody safe? Yeah, I, I'm glad you asked me that question. But Daytona State, I'm sure, is doing the same thing most of the other colleges are doing they, they certainly have a commitment towards having as much protection for the students as possible. They went to a number of virtual classes for those students that wanted it, but we still have students that want to have a face-to-face -face interaction. They want to sit in a classroom and they want to hear a lecture. So for myself, I used to teach in one specific room every semester. This was my room. Every year it was the same room. And you got used to it. The problem it was a fairly small room and I could pack it in. It, it sat 40 and there were two many times were, there were just a full 40 there. So that's way too close. So they moved me to a small auditorium. They cut my class in half. So instead of having 40 students registered for my class, they only had 20. So that spread out the seating even more. Uh, the students are required to wear a mask. If a student refuses to wear a mask, then the administration wants us to simply cancel the class. That's it. There's no arguing with the student. There's no debate about it. It's just that everybody can't have a mask on when you can't have a class. And none of the students 
students have challenged that as far as I know. So it seems to be working out. The students who want to be there understand that there are certain commitments they have to make to social distancing, to mask wearing, things like that. What also happens is we, we cut the class uh, time length down. So it, a traditional class was an hour and 20 minutes, and you had 10 minutes between each class. Well, what would happen there is as my 8 o'clock class is getting out at 9.20, my 9.30 class is trying to get in. And so what we had was just a lot of students pushing in and out of the same doorway. So what they did, and I, this is what I thought was a smart idea, they said, let's let them out early and get all the kids out of the room. And then when the next class comes, these kids can come in and you're not, you know, possibly between the doorway. So I thought that was a good idea. There's, there's a lot of little stuff that you don't think of that they seem to be doing right. So the, the class time's cut down a little bit. That's a bummer, but we've made it more safe. And everybody's got to make optimizes. So, the, you know, that's the way some of the things go. What's also happened is I tend to teach on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So it's two days a week for the same class. And what they did was they said, why don't we just meet face-to-face -face one day a week? And we'll do that, and the rest of it will be virtual. So I predicted that this was going to happen in the summertime and it, it, when we cancel face-to-face -face classes in the spring I went home and I filmed my classes sitting in my office which happens to all go up Daytona Beach I have a great place where I live and what I found was I wasn't doing the lectures justice I was sitting down I didn't have a board uh, I didn't feel like a professor so what I did was I started to go into the college I would set up a camera and a tripod in an empty classroom my classroom the one that I've always used and I've got the board there and I recorded my lectures there and during the summer I went in all during the summer and recorded the other half of the semester the beginning half that I had not that I had done in person last semester so the students who are now in my class I've told them if there's any days where you're not feeling great you don't think it's a good idea to come in all of the lectures are up online and so there's you watch videos of me giving lectures on everything from you know how memory processes work to how a neuron connects through the brain and uh, the other class I teach a lot at Daytona State is developmental psychology. So we look at uh, progress from the moment egg eats, eats sperm to old age and die. So that's a great class as well. But I think the colleges have been really trying to do the best they possibly can. And they've come up with some very unique ways to do it. It sounds like there's a lot of things that have changed for the better. I know even just going to the store and seeing the stores kind of being more proactive about cleaning up the carts. Like these are things that you probably we should have been doing anyway, but we needed a pandemic to remind us to do all of these things. Yeah, I think we could all use a little more cleanliness habits. And yeah, the pandemic is driving that stuff home. You know, there's, it, it's funny because I would talk to people and they, I'd say the importance of washing your hands. They go, why do you need to wash your hands that much? I go, listen, there's X number of times you're in a bathroom during the day. That's where the soap is. That's where the water is. You know? So you want to cut down fluids. You want to cut down the common cold. You want to cut down all of these things. And this was way before the pandemic. I said, just get in the habit of washing your hands really well. Uh, you know what? Why not? It doesn't hurt. I'm, I'm also glad you mentioned shopping. I, I wanted to talk about that earlier. When we talk about work-life balance, we have work, and then we have home life, and we have recreation life, and that type of stuff. But we also have what I, I like to refer to as kind of chores. Stuff we got to do that if we didn't have, we probably wouldn't. And grocery shopping is a good example of that. I'm not sure how many people look forward to grocery shopping, but it's not become a chore, uh, much more so, where you know, a year ago, you would go into the Publix or Windex or wherever you were shopping, and you walk around the aisle and you're thinking about what you might have for dinner three nights from now, and I can help this up, and that might be a treat, and it's casual, and now it's put on your mask, you know, get in there, at the beginning of this pandemic, everybody had gloves on as well, because we weren't sure how the transmission was happening, and the simple thing of having to go food shopping now becomes a real app. There's no joy in in, in food shopping anymore. It's like, let me get in there, uh, let me get out and get this mask off. What's happened, as I said, with burnout from a pandemic, it's these little extra efforts that we didn't have to do before are now becoming part of our life. And, it, and it's an effort that we really don't want to do. No one wants to wear a mask. No one wants to uh, have this pandemic. But it is. And we can't get away from it. But I just thought I'd throw that in because I thought it might be interesting. Very interesting perspective. So what's next for you, Dr. Kramer? Retirement itself. <laughs> 
on the essay. I'm really uh, trying to push out my first book. It started as uh, stories that I told my students, stories like Carol the Hitman teaching me how to kill people in public and get away with it when I was uh, investigating eyewitness identification factors, uh, to a lot of clinical stories that happened you know, within a lot of the uh, hospital settings and clinic settings that I worked at over the years. And I started to expand to, to look at my, my growing up and what were some of the factors that led to me ending up as a psychologist and where am I going? So the, the book's title at this point, the working title is A Psychologist's Life. Uh, I may be putting uh, together some podcasts to get up on the internet uh, to discuss it and promote the book. And I, I'm really hoping that by March I will have it finished. So we'll see what happens. That's very exciting stuff. I'm looking forward to reading it. Great. Great. At least I have one reader. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'll have a lot more. Well, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Kramer. It's my pleasure, Tony. Anytime. So thank you for taking the time to join us today, Dr. Kramer. Be sure to connect with Dr. Kramer via email, and I'll drop his email in the show notes below. So it's time for this week's coding pro tip, and it's brought to you by Discount Medical Supply Store. Are you in need of PPE? If so, you're in luck. Discount Medical Supply Store has the lowest prices on all your PPE needs, including N95 masks, surgical masks, respirators, and so much more. Visit our website alphacodingexperts.com and head over to the deals and discounts tab for a link to take advantage of special pricing on all your PPE needs. If you have a coding related question and would like it to be featured in one of our coding pro tips, please reach out to me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. So this week's coding pro tip comes to us from Orlando, Florida. Hi, Tony. If a doctor documents time-based coding elements of 20 minutes, but the note supports a level four, would you code it as a level three or the higher level based on the elements? So this is a great question, and this comes up a lot. And I think it comes back to time-based being the trumping factor for that visit. So based on the guidelines, based on the interpretations, if time, the majority of the visit is spent in counseling and or coordination of care, then that would be a situation where time would trump the elements. So I hope that points you in the right direction. Please remember to hit that subscribe button now so you never miss another episode. Also, be sure to drop us a rating and review on iTunes. We really appreciate your support. So this concludes today's episode. Until next week, thank you for listening to the Alpha Coding Podcast. We'll see you next Monday. For more information about medical coding and billing pro tips, including how to hire alpha coding experts, follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, or visit our website at www.alphacodingexperts.com.